<clears throat> and so let can you get the door for me please we dropped off here last time uh, where the was there, was there anything that you needed clarification on this or any questions that you had? We can, we can look at the distillation behavior again if you wish. Um, but the, the tricky thing about azeotropic behavior is that you can't easily distill one substance from another. You can, you can distill it away from the azeotrope, um, but you can't necessarily completely separate the species because whenever the azeotrope is boiling, that's what you collect in the, in the collection flask. So, so here on the left is a high boiling azeotrope. Can we look at the temperature axis to learn that? You know, it has the higher boiling point than either, either of the pure substances. And so that's going to stay in the, in the pot or in the distillation still in the bottom. Um, and what's going to be collected is whatever excess component you have. So if, you're, if you have excess A, then A can be collected as long as there's excess A. But then once you have removed all the excess A, then the temperature will jump up and you start distilling over the azeotrope. If you have deficient A, which means you have excess B, then you'll collect whatever excess B you have and then it will eventually jump up to the azeotrope. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you can separate a little bit of the A and B in whatever's excess or deficient, um, whatever's excess from the azeotropic composition. But now let's look at the, the low boiling azeotrope, the one on the right. This azeotrope has, a, if you were to look at the pressure curve, it has a higher vapor pressure than either of the pure components. So it has a lower boiling point. This would be the example for ethanol and water. So whenever you try to distill uh, ethanol away from water, you get the azeotropic composition. It's like 95% ethanol, 5% water. You can't get rid of that 5% water because the lower boiling point is that 5% water and ethanol. It has a lower boiling point than ethanol by itself. So they need that's sort of the natural mixture. So if you want to get it away from the natural mixture, you denature it. <laughs> you get it away from the natural mixture, you may put in a third component and break that azeotrope. So a lot of times you can distill ethanol away from some other solvent, you just can't distill it away from water. And so you can do uh, some sort of two-phase swap where you put in an organic phase and the ethanol goes into the organic phase and leaves water behind, and then you distill ethanol away from the organic phase. I use it to remove my water from my reaction. You use ethanol to remove water? Yeah. So you got to bring it off, put a little water in there, mm -hmm. and add ethanol without causing the problem? Okay, because water is so soluble in ethanol, it's going to go into that from your organic phase. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you must have very little solubility of ethanol in your organic phase. Yeah, probably because of the hydrogen bonding. Yeah. yeah. And so the part of the thing, too, with the HSP project for your thing, it may not be changing the solubility. It may just be something that you study the Hansen solubility parameters of all of the things that you have in your project, right? And so how far away is your solvent system from ethanol? We can plot that on the Henson solubility parameters plot. And you can say, yeah, this is a safe thing to do because ethanol is so far away from my organic solvent and it's so close to water that the water and ethanol are going to pair up in the one phase and leave the organic phase dry. Does your reaction produce water? Is it a condensation reaction? No, it's a purpose. So it's usually when I'm trying to precipitate. Okay. Uh, precipitate out and then I, but I use water for my precipitation. And so I can I can then put everything in a round bottom, add ethanol back in, and oh, the, off. the water poisons the solubility and then it precipitates. That's what you're doing? Okay, yeah. And then you use ethanol as a cleanup. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So in this situation, no matter where we are on that phase diagram on the right, what's in the collection flask after we do the distillation is the azeotrope. <clears throat> now, yes? How would the PSTS diagram that you were introduced to everyone? We don't have any of those. <laughs> it gets ugly. Yeah, it does. Uh, because, again, how do you plot it, right? You, you've got a third dimension, and it's, uh, it's not easy, easy to plot. 
a lot of times they'll do teens diagrams and we'll see one of those it's a triangular plot um, and we have that when we get to the solid phase phase diagrams um, solid state phase diagrams uh, but I don't have any that I that I can show you on my computer um, you might be able to find some online yeah but yes you can there's uh, again the definition of the azeotrope is just right here uh, well, it was earlier. Um, it's just that the vapor composition matches the liquid composition. So you could have that with a three-component mixture, okay? But think about how probable, how probable it would be. So when you get up to three-component mixtures, it, you could still have them, but when you're four and five, it's, it's getting less and less probable that the volatility of all five of those compounds would give you the same composition in the vapor as in the liquid state, okay? So uh, I've got a whole book on azeotropes upstairs and I was just reading in the introduction because I had a company that, that contracted with me to try to determine if this five component mixture was an azeotrope. And I told them up front, I said, I mean, I will, I will bet quite a bit <laughs> that it's not gonna be an azeotrope because it's five components, just probabilistically that you're just not going to get the same vapor composition as you get in the liquid state. Okay, it's just the intermolecular attractions are such in the liquid state that, you know, that's going to be so different than what you have in the vapor state. And so uh, it wasn't. <laughs> okay, it was a, maybe an azeotrope with two components that left the other three. Uh, one component came over by itself. So it was, the, you know, the boiling point match for the first component that came over. And so I just distilled one component away from the other four. <laughs> okay, and then the next component came over and it was kind of an odd mixture, so maybe it was azeotropic, but again, we had a four component mixture here and two of them came over together. And so then that, that, that wasn't an azeotrope. Maybe those two, if I took taken that collection flask and then reboiled that, it might have been an azeotrope. So um, you can't really determine if that two component mixture is an azeotrope by coming out of four, but it was a condensate, so it cond they condensed together and so that's likely that there would be an azeotrope. So you pull that condensate over and distill it by itself. And then you can see if those two components come over together again at that same composition. I, yes? So there are azeotrope at a given temperature. So if you went above or below that temperature, that would... That would uh... Yes, that has an impact as well. And they're also miscible at certain temperatures and not miscible at others. And so uh, what we have here is we have all of these possibilities. So this is out of the CRC, which I didn't realize, but as I was looking at the CRC and comparing this book, the same figures in that book, and I looked at it and the CRC is just a collection of stuff from the literature into a handbook. Now it's bigger than a handbook, it's enormous, right? But it was a handbook 100 years ago. It's about this size, you know, uh, like a three, like a third size book, but now it's full size, you know, 1500 pages. They still call it a handbook. Okay. The CRC stands for Chemical Rubber Company. So it's a private publication of the Chemical Rubber Company. And they just produced it for their scientists and engineers. So it's a nice desk reference that they had. Uh, but they pull, you know, they don't do the research. They just pull information from the literature. And the source on azeotropes was this big book that I have on azeotropes. And here are, you know, probably all of the possibilities. We have... Uh, this YAXA plot, and so if you think about what that is, that's the vapor phase composition plotted versus the uh, liquid phase composition. So that's another phase diagram that we haven't really talked about. Yeah, where they touch is the azeotropic point because YA equals XA. Okay. And so then we have uh, the PX diagrams in the middle, and we have the TX diagrams on the right. And so this is a great plot because you can see uh, when you have a, high, a, a low boiling azeotrope, here's the boiling point of the azeotrope, here's the temperature of the pure components. So the low boiler has a high vapor pressure, and that makes sense, right? It's more volatile, so it has a lower boiling point. So the PX and TX plots are kind of inverse from each other. High vapor pressure means low boiling point. So those scientific principles ought to be just ironed into your head. <laughs> Okay, and that, that's the simple, those are the simple ones. This is a low boiler, let's find a high boiler. Here's a high boiling azeotrope. It's not very volatile, so low vapor pressure. 
here gives me a high boiling point here. Okay. And then we have, uh, here's a double lazy trope. So yes, it could happen. <laughs> so here, this particular mixture has a very low vapor pressure, has a very high boiling point. And so that's an easy trope at that point. But then we also have a spot where it's a low boiler, a very volatile mixture. So I, I don't know of what substance would give you that, but we might be able to dig through that book and find it. It's really strange. But if you're looking at this, and also because of the strange behavior, there's not much separation between Y and XA, YA and XA. So you can see that here. This is YA plotted versus XA, and you see places where the the um, the uh, vapors enriched in one component or depleted in one component. Well, that's a double azeotrope. Yes. So if you have a let's say a, you're right in the middle between those two azeotropes, and is where your mole yeah. fraction is. All right, very good. So 50/50. We start yeah. at a 50/50. And we boil it. Is it going to go up or down? It depends on what it is. Is the temperature going to go up or down to get to, to boil? Like, I guess I'm asking. Are we doing a fractional distillation? Yes. Okay. So, so let, me, let me zoom in on this region here. It's a great, great question. A fun question. That, that's a great question for an exam. Okay. So we have this high part. I'm going to... Oh, dear. Go away. Okay. So we have this high... All right, I'm going to really exaggerate the difference between these two, okay? What beautiful art. <laughs> Why did it do that? Oh, yeah, key. Thank you. Okay, so let me go back here. Yep, and then start this guy. Okay, so then here we are. I got to the edge. Maybe I shouldn't go too close to the edge. This is my... XA, right? Mm -hmm. This is the ugliest one I've ever seen. <laughs> one and zero. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so we're ready 50 50, 50 50, right here, and we boil that, that guy. Now that we can see the, the this is, this is y, YA on the top, and this is X on the bottom. Okay, so what's going to, when you said, what's it going to do? What's your question about it? What it are you talking about? The, which way is the mole fraction going to move? Uh, but there's two mole fractions. There's a vapor phase mole fraction and a liquid phase mole fraction. And we collect the vapor phase mole fraction in the collection flask. So we really have two liquid phases. One's in the collection flask and one's in the pot. In the pot, what is the, which way would the mole fraction move? Okay, so here's the pot. The vapor is way over here. So the vapor is enriched in A, and we take it away. And so if we're taking away excess A, the pot has to move left. Yeah. So as we distill this, the pot is going to creep uphill. And the collection flask is going to drop down, you know, and end up here. So we will collect the low boiling azeotrope. We always collect the lowest boiling point. You wouldn't actually ever get full A. You would always get that low boiling. We get the low boiling azeotrope in our in our collection flask, and the pot would approach the high boiling azeotrope. Yeah. So the pot moves uphill, and eventually the pot is up here, and the collection flask is down here. Yeah. And so this one is, is really no different than what we had for a, a single lazy trope, but it's just now it's three phase diagrams. So if we were over here, the collection flask would collect B, and the pot would move towards the high boiling azeotrope. If we were over here, we had mostly A with a little dirty B in it, okay? <laughs> and the collection flask would collect the low boiling azeotrope, and the pot would move uphill towards pure A. Yeah. Now you say, wait a second, can't we purify A then? But the pot is never pure. So we can't use that to purify A because the, 
the pot has all of the non-volatile components in it and boiling chips and all of that stuff. It's in, in decomposition products. And so we could distill away this azeotrope and purify that, but whatever roofs uphill, whatever's in the pot, the still bottom, it's, it's not pure. So you can't really use the still bottom. You know, you can't purify what's in the still bottom. It's got a lot of non-volatile components and greases and oils and, and cross-link, you know, decomposed molecules. Yeah. In fact, still bottoms is a waste category. Like if you're checking the box on what kind of waste it is, one of the options is a still bottom. So in that system, there's an, is there any possible way to get pure A into the electric device? I think if you had enormous volumes, okay, then you would have dirty A here. If you boiled away as, as much B as you could, you'd have a still bottom that was right there, okay? Now, if you continued to boil that, you might be able to get some of that A out. So once all the B's gone, your collection up here, your condensate temperature would start to creep uphill and it would approach the, the boiling point of A plus or minus whatever the impurities are doing to that boiling point. But eventually A would start to come over if you had a large enough volume. You know, the reason I say if you had a large enough volume is because, you know, this may, um, this may, um, you know, you don't want to boil things dry. So if you had a large enough volume, you're, after you boil off the B, you may still have some uh, A, enough A in there to distill over. But then you would still, you know, so some of the pure A would come off eventually, and then you'd have a really dirty bottom, you know, that you would just stop once it got small enough. Okay, so yes, you could purify a little bit of A out of that still bottom. Yeah. Okay, now there's some things on here that I haven't explained. Points. Yeah, the points. Okay, and notice it says heterogeneous here. So this is a really a big pain. I don't like these at all. Um, this right here is a two-phase liquid. So you've got two phases there. And, and so you have phase separation. This is another one. You have phase separation here. And if you're in the middle here, you've got a layer that has this composition and a layer that has that composition. And you'd have to use the lever rule to figure out what what those uh, two phases are telling you, you know, what the composition of those two phases are. And then down here you have a, a two phase liquid. So partially miscible is the same as heterogeneous. You know, there's reason, regions where it's miscible and regions where it's two phases. And so that's what we're gonna cover next in the notes is this partial miscibility or, or phase separation. Very important for, for uh, your, whose work does the phase, like two phase synthesis, isn't it? So, it's y'all's? Yeah. yeah. It can. We're not, we're not necessarily working with it right now. Okay. Okay. I saw the talk of uh, Hobbes' advisor, and so that's how I know. I was like, oh, wow, they do two-phase synthesis, and they play with the different phases, and I thought that would really be helpful to know the hence and solubility parameters of these different phases. And, and so that's, that partial miscibility is something that's uh, worth doing, worth looking into. Okay, so let's move into the partial miscibility. This set of notes um, 